Welcome to T21 Mom. Hi, friends, and welcome to the T21 Mom podcast. My name is Mary, and my daughter Ainsley has Down syndrome and the dual diagnosis of autism, and she's 11 years old. And this is episode 120. And on today's episode, I am talking with Lauren Zwick. I've kind of been following her for a little while now. She has quite a unique and fascinating story, I think. She has identical twin girls who have mosaic Down syndrome. Now, mosaic Down syndrome, as I'm sure many of you know, is already quite rare in and of itself, but then throw in the mix identical twins. And it's a really interesting, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So let's go have a listen. Today on the T21 Mum podcast, I'm talking with Lauren Zwick. I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> Who I think has quite a fascinating story. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Mary, for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Before we jump in, Lauren, do you want to share a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, so we live in kind of rural West um, So my husband, Brian, is a music teacher. He teaches uh, middle and high school choir. Mm-hmm. I just went back to teaching special ed this year. That's what my degree was in. And I went back to it after nine years of being home with my kiddos. So a uh, big change this year. And then we have four children. So we have our oldest, Joshua, and he's 10. And then we have twin girls who are eight years old, and that's Emma and Lily. And then Matthew is five, almost six, and he's in kindergarten. So, and our twin girls have mosaic Down syndrome. (laughs) Which is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So you've got a busy household there. (laughs) So we'll try not to be too, too long here. But uh, I've been following your story for a little while now, and I think it's quite fascinating, quite unique. You have identical twins, which both have mosaic Down syndrome, as you just mentioned. Now, this has to be incredibly rare. Do you know what the odds are? or Have you met any other families like yourself? So I had to Google some things. I... I remember looking this up when they were born, the odds, because it is very rare. There's not any actual real statistics out there that, and I'm not really a math person, I can't figure it out, but they, what I found was one in 700 babies about have Down syndrome. About 2% of those have mosaic Down syndrome. So then it's, you know, a rare part of that population. And then... The chances of having identical twins is about one in 250. So however that works out, it's very rare. Through online groups, I have met, I think, two or three other moms that have twins that are very similar to mine, which I know we're going to get into, but where both identical twins have mosaic they don't necessarily look alike and they are very developmentally different. So, so we're out there, but I haven't met any in person. So pretty rare. Yes. I think it's really quite interesting and I'm hoping that you'll be able to explain, you know, why it's, you know, a little bit about how they don't actually look identical, which I think is really just, it's, Mm -hmm. I just find it so fascinating. Now, I know you said that mosaic, it is actually, mosaic Down syndrome is quite rare. And I did one other episode on mosaic Down syndrome and they didn't find out till he was almost a year old. And can you explain what mosaic Down syndrome is and how does it differ from typical Down syndrome? Yeah. So, and I did, I listened back to that episode. I really enjoyed (laughs) hearing Christy, I think was her name. I'm yes. hearing her perspective. Yeah. So how I always explain it, the short way to people is that, you know, people with mosaic Down syndrome, instead of having a <laughs> full extra copy of the 20 chromosome, instead of having that whole extra chromosome, 
some of their cells have it and some of their cells don't. So they just have two different kinds of cells and that's how that works, I guess. That's kind of how the geneticist explained it to me. Right. And so how do they actually test for mosaic Down syndrome? I know for typical Down syndrome, it's just a karyotype. Is it the same thing for mosaic Down syndrome? I had meant to look this up. So they had a blood test, and I don't actually know like the name of the test, but they had a blood test when they were born, which I can maybe get into more in a little bit, but they they test a certain number of cells, I believe, and then they tell you the percentage of those cells that are affected. And so they actually had that test twice, both times it was confirmed mosaic Down syndrome. I don't actually know, though, how it differs from what they would typically do for a test. I do believe that, like you said, they t they look at a higher number of cells. I can't remember what that is. Maybe 500. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I don't know what it is for regular Down syndrome, 50, maybe. I'm not entirely sure. So, yes. So, although your daughters are actually identical twins they don't look identical as their mosaicism affects them differently are you able to explain this like why this is so again as far as like what the geneticist explained to us is that it just depends they they described it as it depends where the down syndrome is located in their body you know where that extra chromosome material is but the only way they would know that is by invasive testing that is not necessary you know so i guess did you want me to expand into like how my girls are are different or yeah like how does mosaicism occur because is it at conception or is it prior i guess they, they're identical yeah, they so think Mm -hmm. They think that it's during the slight splitting process that sometime as cells, like as the baby and everything is being formed, like as things are dividing, that somewhere in there is when it happens. Mm -hmm. And again, my girls are eight, so some of it is kind of blurry because it all happened after, right after they were born. And the geneticist describe something that they call a trisomy rescue and so one i don't know if it's a theory or this this is actual like what happens or so they think is that like that possibly some of the cells are like repaired or like get rid of some of that extra chromosome but not all of it as it's like splitting so again that's what he kind of explained to me at the hospital but Oh, interesting. I've never heard that term before. So that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So how does their mosaicism affect them differently? Like, for example, do they both do therapies? Do they have similar delays or or not? Yeah. So Emma is a lot smaller than Lily for one link. She's a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people, when they hear I have twins, they think that Emma and her younger brother are the twins because <laughs> she's just a lot shorter than Lily. They have the same hair and eye color, but Emma's hair is really straight and Lily's is really curly. Oh, wow. So even that is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which you do see that in identical twins sometimes. Anyway, there's, of course, differences. But she, Emma has, Emma has a lot more physical features of Down syndrome. That's like the easiest way I can think to explain it over audio is that People look at Emma and they know that she mm -hmm. has Down syndrome. She has like, you know, more almond shaped eyes and just kind of small features and everything. And people do not know that she has Down syndrome. And even after interacting with her, they don't know unless mm -hmm. she tells them about it. So, oh, and then you asked about like therapies and things like, again, Emma has a lot of other things such as autism. She has speech apraxia that contributes as well. But she has always had lots of therapies, PT, OT, speech, and, you know, just kind of every kind of service that we can get for her. 
she still is nonverbal mostly. She uses a communication device, uses sign language mm. to communicate, and then just a few like verbal approximations. And then Lily, again, she doesn't have any any of that. She doesn't need any of that. You you definitely wouldn't know interacting with her and she surprises people all the time when she tells them that she has down syndrome so so very unique situation like do you know what their percentage is like do they have a different percentage of cells or do you know yeah so their percentages are about the same which is interesting mm -hmm. so one of the tests came back as like both of them had, like, one was 19% and one was 20 or something. And then we did the test again six weeks later, which I could explain further if you want to get into all their, like, diagnosis and all of that. But Lily, no, not Lily. I, I don't know. I don't know which percentages went with which girls, but, like, <laughs> one had, like, 32 and one had 35 the second time. Like, the percentage is, I mean, wow. I would say fairly low. Yeah. Uh, but what they told us at the hospital was like, it it doesn't really tell us anything. And that has, you know, proven to be true. I I always have gotten on a soapbox about that just because it's mosaic doesn't mean that it is less challenging or that there won't be, you know, it just, it doesn't tell you anything about what that person's life is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And they are very unique girls and unique from one another. And so, yeah, it's been an interesting road. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. So you find out you were having twins and I'm sure elation probably coupled with a little bit of terror. <laughs> but when did you find out they actually had mosaic Down syndrome? Was it a prenatal diagnosis or a birth diagnosis or... Or how did they, like, it sounds like it was, you found out while you're at the hospital, but how did mm -hmm. you find out? So ours was kind of a long journey, although I know some people don't get like diagnosed with mosaic until much later. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were, it, it was a birth diagnosis. So what happened was found out I was having twins at about eight weeks. Then at about 12 weeks, they were, they confirmed that they were mono die twins which just means they shared a placenta but they each had their own like sac okay. so like it's it's a higher risk pregnancy and that's typically an identical twin like fraternal twins can share a placenta but it's more so in cases where the two placentas like fused early on and so okay. so they're mono die twins so we knew that there were some higher risks involved including this twin to twin transfusion syndrome where one twin like the uh the vessels in the placenta can kind of you can have one twin kind of donating blood to the other for lack of a better explanation but placental blood sharing basically between the two so that's mainly like what they're monitoring for um and at about i think 16 weeks that's when they started doing every other week ultrasound so every two weeks i had ultrasounds and that was just because it was a high-risk twin pregnancy and so at 16 weeks they were doing the anatomy scan which is a little earlier than normal normally mm -hmm. that's at like 20 weeks well part of emma's brain had a lot of fluid in it and lily's didn't and they were like well we see this this fluid and Sometimes this early on, when, you know, when they're 16 weeks, like that fluid still needs time to clear up. Like that's normal for younger babies. And then as they develop, it'll go away. But your girls are identical and we see it in this one, but not the other. So, you know, we want to, we're not sure what's going on, but that doctor thought that Emma would have something called Dandy Walker syndrome, which is, from what I understand, can cause. Like it causes hydrocephalus, like water in the brain. And then, you know, possibly needing a shunt or surgery when they're born can cause like seizures and other developmental delays. So that was like the first time it was kind of on my radar, you know, just like 
oh, maybe my baby will have a disability. Um, but the way the doctor presented that news, I frankly thought that he was telling me my baby was going to die mm -hmm. because he presented it so like a social worker came in and handed me Kleenex and they were staring at me like, well, they and I was like, but is my baby going to survive? Is she going to be OK? You know? Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that'll be fine. And so, well, I was just relieved. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I knew, okay, she might have some challenges, but I, again, I, my background is in special ed. I had been a special ed teacher before having kids. So I, I was kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll be ready for this, whatever is going to come. I mean, it was scary news, but it wasn't like a for sure thing. Mm -hmm. So then we went back at 18 weeks, the brain had cleared, like the fluid was not there. They're like, oh, looks like it wasn't that. But then they were doing more of the, like, anatomy scan, I think. They probably couldn't get everything. And, like, they were scanning her heart, and they couldn't find this ductus venosus, which is this vessel that I think connects the placenta to the heart, mm -hmm. and then it closes after birth. They're like, well, we cannot find this vessel anywhere, but her heart is functioning and looks fine. Okay. It's beating and everything. They're like, so it's it must be there, but we can't find it. And it's all squished in there with twins and they're tiny. It's hard to see. So we go, we were referred to cardiology. So then at cardiology, they find three holes in her heart. Oh, wow. But they were small mm -hmm. and they were just following that then. And so again, this whole time, Lily is just still developing just fine. No issues. They're just kind of following Emma. So then we eventually, quite late, I mean, I don't know, 28 or 30 weeks, they finally at cardiology found the vessel that they were looking for in a scan. But it was it was kind of in a different place than they expected, and it was taking a different route. So again, through all these things, though, Down syndrome never came up. They never said like, oh, these are signs of Down syndrome. I remember them telling me her legs were measuring shorter. Mm -hmm. They never mentioned Down syndrome. But like looking back, I'm like, oh, those were probably markers of like, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of genetic condition. So then around 30 weeks, I finally decided to do that maternity 20, T21 mm -hmm. blood test because I was just really anxious, really worried. By that point, Emma was also growth restricted. And so she stopped growing at about like 30 weeks. They they were watching me really closely. I was on like scans every like three days. And I was just really worried about my baby again, mm -hmm. about her surviving. Mm -hmm. And both of them surviving, but especially her. So I did the test. They called at like 32 weeks and they said, well, it's negative for Down syndrome. <laughs> And a possible, they said, eh, there's a slight possibility that it's mosaic Turner syndrome. Like, okay. So then they explained to me at that point what mosaic, what a mosaic syndrome was. They explained to me how mosaic Turner syndrome works, which is similar to mosaic Down syndrome. Like some cells are affected, some aren't. And I knew someone from college who had Turner syndrome. So I was like, okay, you know, the possibility, but they, they they still said it wasn't, you know, it was like, a, I think they said 60% or which I mean, was really high, but mm -hmm. they didn't give me a for sure diagnosis and said you could do an amnio, but the risk at that stage of pregnancy is just preterm labor. And mm -hmm. I was already very high risk for that. So I just chose to wait it out. So then they were born at 34 weeks and six okay. days. Okay. Just, my water broke. I went into labor. And so Emma was three and a half pounds and Lily was five and a half pounds. Okay. <laughs> um, and they had had some of that, just a small amount of the placental blood sharing, like not enough that anything had really come up on the ultrasound because they do mm -hmm. do this laser surgery for that if it's really severe, but nothing had really come up. But Anyway, 
So that was happening. So just to remember that, because I'll explain okay. that later, then why we had two blood tests. But right when they were born, they like put them in my arms and I, they had to go to the NICU, but I got to hold them first. And mm -hmm. right away, I looked at Emma and I was like, oh, she has Down syndrome. That was my first thought. Wow. And then they whisked them away. And a few hours later, whenever I went over to the NICU, then they were... One of the doctors was talking to me and was like, you know, are are you sure that they were identical? And I said, well, that's what everyone told me through the pregnancy, but I don't know. And he said, well, you know, Emma has some signs of Down syndrome. And I said, I did notice that. And they said, we'd really like to test both girls since even though this baby doesn't look like it, we just want to test them both. And then we'll check to make sure that they are identical twins or like what kind of twins they are. Like, okay. okay. So then a few days later, I don't know how much time had passed, but I was in the NICU and the NICU doctor and the geneticist, I think, both came like in person to deliver the news. And they said, well, like we suspected Emma has Down syndrome. She has mosaic Down syndrome, actually, and Lily has it too. And so oh, that was a uh, that was a really emotional day. Mm -hmm. That was really intense because that hadn't been on my radar really the whole pregnancy. That mm -hmm. the possibility of both of them having that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, like I said, they had had this blood sharing. And so Emma was born really anemic and she had kind of been giving her blood to Lily, basically. Mm -hmm. And so Lily was really dark red and her blood was thick when she was born. And it kind of righted itself, but we had to wait six weeks to t test again because they thought, wait, what if it's like Emma's blood mm -hmm. that's being mm -hmm. detecting the blood test? So it was another kind of waiting game, but that it just confirmed what they had already told us. So what did that feel like when they told you, like here you thought one of the twins had Down syndrome, but then they tell you both. What was that? I'm sure we all have that moment when we find out the diagnosis. I had a birth, uh, prenatal diagnosis. Yours was a birth diagnosis. But you have two babies. What? was that like I really I think like a lot of moms you know I definitely went into a grieving period but it took a while because I didn't I felt bad for grieving it <laughs> I remember thinking things like this is so unfair how could it be both of them and on the flip side, though, like immediately being angry at myself, like, how could I think that way? Like, I was a special ed teacher. I love people with disabilities. How could I be upset about this? Like, so it was that back and forth in my mm -hmm. head, arguing with myself, being mad at myself for being sad. So I think that was, you know, that was just really difficult. And plus, I had a 22-month-old. So, I mean, I always tell people I mostly don't remember the first year because it was just a whirlwind of caring for all the babies, you know, mm -hmm. basically three babies. And so it took a long time to really, I think the girls were about a year old when I finally reached out to, like, the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network, and we have a Gigi's Playhouse an hour away, got connected there. Like, so that, that was, you know, it just took me a long time to kind of get to that point mm -hmm. where I wanted to really, I had lots of great, like, family and friends supporting me. We have a long history of, like, educators in my family, and my mom was a speech therapist and she was there helping me every day and just had a ton of support in that regard but internally I, I was really struggling yeah and I'm sure 
I totally get what you're saying. Like you were feeling bad for feeling bad, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all been there. I remember, like, I remember personally, like, I was devastated that my only child would be born with Down syndrome. And, you know, and I thought my life was over. And, you know, and that just, it hurts my heart to think that I thought that. Because for me personally, it was because I was ignorant. I, did, I really didn't know much about Down syndrome. I only had seen a few in the community and a church or what have you, but I didn't really know anybody. And I think we're scared of things that we don't know. So I think you need to cut yourself some slack. You had two kids, yeah. you get that diagnosis at birth, you know, and it just, it just flips your world around. And then you just have to navigate yeah. a whole new way as which I'm sure you've done. And you know that now, I've heard. but yeah, I can't yeah. imagine that it's overwhelming. You have, it's not just one child, it's two. So, okay. yeah. And so. Emma, she also has the dual diagnosis of autism. And when was she diagnosed with this? And, you know, my daughter also has a dual diagnosis. And how has that been? Yeah, so she was diagnosed at about three and a half. I, I knew or I felt like I knew pretty early on, mm -hmm. actually, because she didn't socially smile until like nine months. And like by that point, I think, and we've had really overall great, like, doctors and specialists, and I've really, you know, not many complaints there at all, but I think some things definitely do get written off, like, as well, it's typical for kids with Down syndrome to, yeah. you know, not meet those milestones right away, but I just started then asking in my mom groups, like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, because I think I was in, like, a birth group or something or a Down syndrome group and I said like you know my daughter's not smiling yet when is when did your kid smile was it later than you know and I heard as late as like five months I was like oh nine months is really late and I just noticed a lot of other things with her you know just kind of when she was that little I just felt like she kind of wasn't engaging with the world around her or something mm -hmm. like it was just really hard to see that. And then as she got older, you know, she did a lot of stimming and just some of those things. And then the verbal skills. Now she did have some regression where she used to know like a hundred signs. At one point I had written down, you know, all these, she wasn't speaking, but she was doing sign language. And mm -hmm. then, you know, that mostly went away. I She, she still doesn't use like a ton of signs, but she understands a lot. And like earlier, I think she also eventually got an apraxia diagnosis, which mm -hmm. you know, that all kind of overlaps. And it's kind of hard to say which thing is causing the most struggle on a certain day. But the, the autism piece, honestly, like the, there hasn't been much that's changed in terms of therapies or anything like that, because we already she was already getting so much therapy and support that I feel like was really tailored to her and her needs mm -hmm. and but honestly it gave me a, a peace of mind and some mm -hmm. validation because I had suspected for so long mm -hmm. you know a few years and so oh. validating to me that that diagnosis in particular was not super emotional for me it was like finally somebody can understand like what I'm seeing and it, it is accurate and this it does help I think people to understand um you know teachers and other people that work with her or are trying to get to know her like can understand some of those things that might be different from their past experiences with someone with down syndrome for example you know mm -hmm. she still is very social she really likes to be with people but she doesn't like eye contact still and mm -hmm. you know um is, is very sensory seeking actually but yeah um still i always she makes me laugh every day when we get home from school she goes right upstairs with her little music because she loves listening to music nonstop. Mm -hmm. so she gets her music and she goes upstairs that's the door and just wants to be alone <laughs> so she likes her alone time too <laughs> that's totally okay 
Well, that's really, I'm yes. happy to hear that, that you said the getting the diagnosis was validating. Uh, for me, it was not, mm -hmm. but it, it was hard. And, uh, but, yeah. but I'm glad to hear that. Like you felt like, okay, everyone understands now what I'm seeing. And like you said, validating, I think like, you know, that's wonderful in that regard. I think that you mm -hmm. could feel that way instead of just feeling so much grief over now another diagnosis, you know, which it's, I found for me yeah. was, was very difficult. I mean, it was delivered terribly as well in my case, but that's a story for it. <laughs> but, you know, so you have yeah. these identical twins and I'm kind of curious, like, do you, like, what are people's reactions? Do you tell the people that they are identical twins or do you just say that they're twins or because I'm sure people don't believe you when you say, yeah, Emma and Lily, they're, mm -hmm. they're identical twins. Yeah. Well, 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 and especially now Lily is very talkative and she is an advocate and she likes to share. Mm -hmm. So she usually jumps in. If I don't elaborate, she, and she will jump in and share all about it. But yeah, I've had kind of a, sometimes it depends on the context. Sometimes I just, I might say that they're twins or whatever, but I don't really go into it. Other times, if people are kind of asking questions, I will start explaining. So I've definitely educated a lot of people on what mosaic Down syndrome is. I mean, I didn't, I had never heard of it until then. And a lot of medical professionals that we've met, you know, the girls were like famous in the NICU. People came just to come and see them and you know talk to me and and hear their story and everything so so yeah yeah I can imagine most medical professionals will probably never see a child you know especially at birth or very near birth being diagnosed with mosaic down syndrome I think it would be very rare and especially in your case a very unique circumstance that there's twins identical twins so I'm Yes, like you said, you've only you're yeah. only aware of one or two other families, so I'm sure it's exceedingly rare. So, how like you mentioned that Emma had some holes in her heart. So, like how how is their health overall? Like, how is her heart? You know, because obviously, you know, our kids tend to just have more health issues right. than the typical population. And how how has their health overall been for both of them? Yeah, I forgot to follow up about that, but she. Once she was born, Emma's three holes in her heart, they closed uh, when she was born. Mm -hmm. Just pretty oh, soon after she was born, they they did an echo and were like, oh, those have all closed up. That's what they had kind of hoped would happen. So that was good. They found her hypothyroidism on her newborn screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she has had hypothyroidism since then. But again, Lily doesn't have that. We just follow that closely because... Yeah, and they're identical, so that could be a mm -hmm. higher risk. Really, Emma Emma had a lot of things sort of the first three years or so. She silently aspirated mm -hmm. on liquids, so we had a whole feeding journey of thickened liquids, and she had had some illnesses and hospital stays due to that whole situation. And she also has, like, some vision issues, so she has glasses, and mm -hmm. Lily doesn't. So... Lily is doing great health wise. Yeah. And Emma, like right now, she's doing great. It's, it's really been pretty smooth over the last couple of years. Oh, yeah. Lily and Emma, we did, you know, there's kind of a list of things when you have a baby with Down syndrome, they give you kind of a checklist almost of like, you should check all of these things. They kind of lined us up with people that, ch you know, check their hearing and vision and just really thoroughly check them over for lots of things. So we did have to do all of those things with both girls. And, you know, now that they're a little older, it's it's a little farther between some of that stuff. But that's great. Yeah. Like Ainsley. Yeah. I mean, she overall is quite healthy, you know, especially for a child with Down syndrome. But the first couple of years were rough. I mean, I think that's probably like with any kid, but they were hard. A lot of like every single bug and stomach that she could possibly pick up, she got. 
So that that's great, though. That sounds like they're on uptick with their health, because as I'm sure you know from listening to Christie's episode, which I thought was kind of so fascinating, is that he had the typical Down syndrome heart defect, but the way his heart was structured was more like a typical person. So and mm -hmm. that surgery is usually done within the first three months. And I think he was mm -hmm. 10 or 11 months at that point. So it was very a very challenging surgery because it's probably maybe a lot of people who don't know if their child doesn't have the heart defect is that we all know how our kids have are very flexible and pliable. So is their heart muscle. And that's what makes it easy to repair. Mm -hmm. And then in his case, that wasn't the case. So it was a, a very challenging surgery, I think, for them. So, but here you have identical twins, one that appears to have Down syndrome, but it's actually mosaic Down syndrome, and another twin that looks more like your typical, like a typical child. How are you finding it? You're in these various worlds. Mm -hmm. You're in the mosaic Down syndrome world the Down syndrome world, the autism world, and also apraxia speech. Like there's a lot going on. And a lot of people feel, you know, I, I can't speak, not, not myself, but just from things that I hear from others in the community, when they have a child with mosaic Down syndrome, they don't really feel like they belong in the Down syndrome community because a lot of people in the Down syndrome community feel, well, you don't, you have it much easier. But as you've proven, mm -hmm. I think that's not always the case. So like, how, how are you finding that? I'm sure it's a bit of a, a challenge. Yeah, I think where I've found the most community is probably in the dual diagnosis sort of groups, meaning moms of kids who have Down syndrome and autism. Mm -hmm. I feel like I probably relate to them the most in terms of the challenges that come up with Emma and just and also like things that we're celebrating and just it's kind of the first group I go to is she has hit some milestone that's mm -hmm. like you know seemingly small but I'm like this is humongous so mm -hmm. I really connect with them the International Mosaic Down Syndrome Association has a retreat every year for families and they do a research and retreat is what they call it so mm -hmm. they bring research as well mm -hmm. and we've never been able to attend but this year it's in the midwest and so we can drive there so we're planning to attend that this year so i'm really excited for that i think i'm especially excited for lily to get to meet other people with mosaic down syndrome because she never has and she's i think would be interested to do that and to talk other people who have this kind of unique experience mm -hmm. well that's that's fantastic that you i didn't know that they did a retreat i go to the mm -hmm. dsdn rock and mums retreat every year and i find that just it for me it just really fills my cup maybe you could put that on mm -hmm. your bucket list too <laughs> There was a. Uh, well, yeah, I should have mentioned. I've been there three times, actually. I've been to that one. Too. Ah. <laughs> Not every year, but three of them I've gone to. So that, and one of them, I, we did like a meet up with some other twin moms, and that mm -hmm. was really fun. And I always try to meet up with some of the other like dual diagnosis moms. It's been a couple years, but I, I try to try to get to those because yeah, those were. That was really powerful. The first retreat that I went mm -hmm. to, my girls were about two by that point. But I remember just pausing and looking around the room and realizing, you know, it just hit me. Every single mom in here has a child with Down syndrome and kind of gets me, you know, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. remember that feeling of unity and just being overwhelmed in a very good way to experience that. So, yes, yes if any moms out there that haven't you know connected with a group like that it's it's well worth it I think oh 100 percent yes and I had the exact same experience as you thinking all these moms in here all have a child with down syndrome so and like you said it was very powerful so you know what like what do you want people to know because I think your like your situation is so unique and so different and but not just about mosaic 
Down syndrome, but about your kids and your family? I guess what I would say is, you know, I have four kids and I have two boys on either side of my girls. And I think it's really cool just to, I homeschooled for a number of years. I homeschooled my kids for a total of four years. So this was their first year back in public school too. But uh, just in my family, we have talked a lot about, I guess, different kinds of smarts is what we call it, or different things that they are good at. And my kids are really good at celebrating one another and celebrating Mm -hmm. what each one is good at. And so I think it's really fun just to have four unique kids and see their different personalities and how they interact with each other and they are all close in age and they're all like best friends and of course they fight with each other too um (laughs) i just feel really privileged i guess that i get to be their mom and get Mm -hmm. to watch watch them learn and grow and um i actually had a really cool experience which Maybe later I'll check with Lily if it's okay that I shared it, (laughs) but I'm going to tell you anyway, because it was so cool as a mom to hear her say this. But the other day we were talking about World Down Syndrome Day and going into her classroom and Emma's classroom to share. And we've, you know, already planned a few things, but she was kind of processing aloud and was like, you know, I, and she's talked to me about this before. She said, I've heard some, some kids make fun of Emma before because of her Down syndrome. And I will say it's been very, very rare, but, you know, this year she's had a couple of experiences overhearing that. And she's like, the kids don't really know that I have Down syndrome too. And if I tell them that I have Down syndrome, then maybe they'll make fun of me. And then she paused for just a second and she's like, but I would do that for Emma. That it was so cool just to see and like to hear such a little person be so willing to up for her sister and to you know just own this part of who she is and mm-hmm. share that with people even mm-hmm. if it means, even if it means that somebody might make fun of her i just am really proud of her that she thinks that way that that's amazing she's going to be a wonderful advocate to emma so how wonderful is that you know that they share such a unique bond and such a unique and interesting story i think i think it would give people pause for thought so but good for her from an eight-year-old wow that's very (laughs) impressive i have to say (laughs) did you want to see if she's available to come up yeah, let me go. I'll I'll go call her. Hi. Hi, Lily. How are you? You're good. Good. Yeah. So your mom was telling yes. me you're you're getting ready for World Down Syndrome Day. So what are you doing for World Down Syndrome Day? So we're gonna put on a presentation for second grade. Mm-hmm. And what kinds of things are we going to share, do you think? I don't know. We've been, <laughs> you don't know. Remember what we did last year, how we shared about, we taught people what Down syndrome was, and then we taught people what it, mosaic Down syndrome was, right? Yeah. And we showed people pictures of mosaics. You know, yep. We showed a picture of what a mosaic artwork was so they could kind of understand. And then we showed all kinds of pictures of you guys. You and Emma and your brothers just doing fun things and teaching them how you guys like to just play things like any second grader, right? Yeah. Sometimes people don't really understand what Emma's doing when she's trying to ask them for something, like if she's hungry or sad Mm -hmm. and they can't understand her. So it's, I think it's, it's kind of hard for her. So do you help sometimes but for you, them to that understand? Helps for people. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because twins naturally know what their older twin wants. 
Well, of course. And especially because you're identical, mm -hmm. right? You might not look quite the same, well, but you're identical, which is pretty cool. Have you ever met any other identical twins? Um, I don't think so. I don't know if you have. Wow. I've met twins, but not identical ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. So what do you want people to know about Down syndrome and Mosaic Down syndrome? So it's kind of a special thing. It doesn't mean that you're any different than anyone. Well, it kind of means you're different, but it doesn't mean that you're, you're some kind of other thing than a person. You're still a person, even though you might act differently. Mm hmm mm hmm And do you tell people that you, sometimes when you're out, do you tell people that you also have Down syndrome when they're talking about your sister? Sometimes, if they're really nice people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Lily. I appreciate you coming on and sharing a little bit about your story. Your mom and I had a really interesting chat today. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, dear. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on today and, you know, sharing you know, such a unique, you're very unique and interesting story about your beautiful family. And that's so lovely that Lily was able to come on and she sounds like she's a wonderful sister and advocate to, to Emma. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you're welcome, sweetie. I really found Lauren's story just so interesting and fascinating, and, and I hope you did too. And I just thought it was so sweet that her daughter Lily came on and talked about, you know, being an identical twin and about them both having Down syndrome. I thought it was just so sweet to have her on. These are my takeaways. As I'm sure you know, number one, that mosaicism is quite rare. It's less than 5%. I believe she said 2% of those born with Down syndrome have mosaicism. And then she had identical twins, which it has to be incredibly rare. And I think it would be so cool to, you know, for her to meet those other families as well, I'm sure, because they would have quite the story to share. And you know, often when people are talking about mosaicism, they wonder what the percentages are. But what I also found was really interesting, number two, was that there's no way to know where it is, you know, because it would just involve really invasive testing. And it's for what point? It's really just more for curiosity. It, it doesn't help the person any better. It doesn't you know, help with additional therapies or anything like that, or give insight into any of that. And number three, what I thought was really interesting is Lauren mentioned about trisomy rescue. I had never heard that before. And it said like, because even though her daughters are identical, they actually don't look identical because the mosaicism is showing up in different parts of their bodies, even though they have roughly the same percentage. I just thought it was just so fascinating. But it the trisomy rescue, as she explained it, was that some cells are repaired or they're able to somehow remove that extra chromosome. And, you know, what I also thought was really cool, number four, was, you know, that yes, they are identical twins, and yes, they look different, but they still share many similarities. Like they have the same eye and hair color. But what I thought was really cool was that Emma has straight hair and Lily's hair is very curly. And she said that's not uncommon or unheard of in identical twins. And I had never heard that before. So again, I found that just so fascinating. fascinating. And Number five, I just, I really loved to hear that they actually have 
a retreat, uh, the International Mosaic Down Syndrome um, Society, they have a retreat every year and that they're going to go this year because as you said, I think it's really important, especially for her daughter, Lily, to meet other kids who also have Mosaic Down Syndrome. So, you know, how fantastic. I know how much the retreat means to me and to be with other moms who just understand my journey and then they'll be with other families and and they also invite researchers which again I think is just so great because I I think it's probably really very little understood uh mosaic down syndrome so I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did and I would love to hear from you. If you would like to share your diagnosis story as I'm starting to uh, chat with others about their diagnosis story, please drop me a line. You can contact me at my website at t21mom.com and you can leave me a message there. You can even leave a little voicemail. So keep on loving on your rocking kiddos and I'll see you next time.